welcome to our final panel discussion. I'd first like to thank Ms. Dula for that lovely, energetic workout that took us back to our childhood days. I hope everyone participated and they have their energy levels up and running for our final panel discussion today. So with that, I'd like to welcome all of you, our wonderful audience that has been through two very eventful days with us. And our discussion today is going to be about policies and best practices in mental health at universities across the world. I would like to welcome our esteemed panelists, Dr. Gayatri Prabhu, Ms. Patty Hambler, Ms. Penny Carlson, and Dr. Paul Fung, all representing from India, Canada, and Australia. My name is Yoshita Tadani, and I am a psychological counselor here at Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing. I will be moderating this extremely insightful session today. I also have here with me Ms. Priyanka Bajaria, who is going to help me with co-moderating by sharing each of our panelists' presentations. Um, I will be introducing our panelists one by one as uh, we go along with our presentations. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker for today, for today Dr. Gayatri Prabhu. Dr. Prabhu is an associate professor at the Manipal Academy of Higher Education. She is also the coordinator of the Student Support Center, a mental health resource for students of Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Since April 2017, this acclaimed and unique initiative has provided several students sustained access to quality psychotherapy in a very accessible and comfortable space. It has also created several opportunities for community conversations around mental wellness for students. Gayatri Prabhu is also the author of a memoir on mental health, If I Had to Tell It Again, and six other books in various genres. She teaches literary studies at the Manipal Center for Humanities. I now request for Dr. Prabhu to take over and begin with her presentation. Good afternoon to all of you. If there's um, ever been a time to talk about mental health considerations in higher education, I think it is certainly now. Considerations that the pandemic has pushed to the fore with new urgency. And so I'm very thankful to all of you, to Dr. Girija Mahale and all the organizers for uh, this invitation. So I'm here, as uh, Yoshita said, to tell you about the work being done at the Student Support Center set up by the Manipal Academy of Higher Education in Manipal. So uh, Priyanka, can I have the next slide? I thought I should uh, show you a little of my space. This is Manipal. It's a campus town in the state of Karnataka, located not far from the Arabian Sea and in view of the Western Ghats. We have over 28,000 students uh, from across the country and the world, and they're studying in over 31 disciplines. And these include health sciences, engineering, humanities. So as you know from the introduction, my full-time job is uh, as a teacher of literary studies. And um, I do believe honestly that it's, an, it's very exciting to be an educator, right? To work with young, vibrant minds, to learn, to grow with them. But as educators, we are also constantly aware, acutely aware that in terms of mental well-being, we are working with the most vulnerable group as identified by the World Health Organization. So many, many of these struggles happen in bleak silences. Uh, some end tragically, some are circumstantial, some chronic, but mostly in India, we have been grappling with the paucity of uh, professionals and limited institutional understanding. So even before the student support center was set up, our campus town did offer many resources for students, excellent hospitals, doctors, psychologists, as well as student counselors. However, in my interactions with my students, it soon became clear to me that the primary challenge is not just whether there are resources, but how to create enough comfort, confidence, and trust in the student community. Right? How to be student-centric in the most resourceful and reassuring way, in a sustained and holistic way. So this is what led to the setting of the Student Support Center at number 125, Manipal. So this happened on April 1st, 2017. We have just completed four years. I'd like to take a moment to show you our space. Okay, so we have modified 
two uh, tile roof houses in a residential area as our office space. This includes six rooms for psychotherapy sessions, a waiting lounge, staff room, relaxation therapy room, a meeting hall, and a little pavilion in the garden that we call the quiet space. Working here full time are six psychologists and two office staff. So as a model, the Student Support Center is pioneering in India. I, I, I have not seen this model elsewhere, so I'm going to even go out on a limb and say perhaps in the world as well. And I consider it as pioneering in terms of the different components of mental well-being that it has brought together under one canopy for students in higher education. So um, what SSC does at a glance, okay? So we offer psychotherapy sessions with clinically trained psychologists who work exclusively with this demographic. The center is located in a non-clinical space that is accessible and private because getting students to the hospital was one of my really biggest it's sort of and, okay. um, and the sessions that we conduct are not linked in any way to hospital or academic records. Most importantly, students don't pay us anything. They are assured of a very high quality attention at no charge. So in addition to psychotherapy, we were, we were able to offer psychiat uh, psychiatric consultations at the same location when needed and if the client agrees. Now this was possible because of visiting consultants from the Kasturba Medical College and Hospital on our campus. The other unique feature of the center is that it has a student advisory board that is comprised of nominated mental health advocates from the student community. So many of these have been our clients and this board, which is renewed annually, works as A, a peer referral system, and then B, it also creates ambassadors for positive mental health practices. As a result, the center is regularly involved in outreach and community work. So um, just so that I want you to say one other aspect that we do, which is that not only do we run workshops, certificate courses, group therapy sessions, but we also curate and host events that celebrate creativity and joy. For instance, music concerts, book groups, art exhibitions, painting sessions, poetry readings, and so on. So students from various institutions come together and they organize this. Since we believe that mental health in higher education must be a collective and ongoing conversation, the events are open to everyone in the community and not just our clients. So when our center was set up, okay, so I admit it was driven by idealism. I wanted to ask for the sky and I did. And now four years later, with a little bit of tweaking, I can say with confidence that this model works. This model works and this model needs to be replicated. So you may ask me, what will it take? And I think there are three slices to this circle. Resources, autonomy, and goodwill. This is at the heart of what makes this model work. To my mind, resources must include two components. First, the financial and logistical generation, uh, generosity of the institutions, right? So we need physical infrastructures, walls, furnitures, computers, salaries, right? And these can only come from the administration at the top level, right? And we are very, very thankful we had that. So no permission was held back. Secondly, resources also include people, right? Volunteers and employees with a progressive approach to mental health not the paternalist, not the punitive, but the empathetic, the compassionate approach that understands that every individual counts. Two, with autonomy, uh, we have to see this in the reporting structure and we have to see it in record keeping. As many of you are aware, in most higher education systems, the measure of a student's emotional well-being is done through their academic performance even more so their academic, rec their attendance records, right? But alas, mental wellness does not work like this. Some of my brightest, most conscientious students are struggling with their mental health. Attending classes regularly or scoring good marks consistently might, just might be one indicator of someone's health, but it cannot be the only parameter. So confidentiality and independent record keeping process becomes vital. And this is only possible if there is autonomy. 
In Manipal, the center reports directly to the vice chancellor for administrative purposes, and it is autonomous in its daily functioning. One of my most important learning experiences from this whole process was the value of trust from the student community. We did several rounds of anonymous surveys, so I can vouch for this. The majority of our students came to us, not because their teacher said so, warden said so, parent said so, but because of word of mouth. They came to us because other students vouched for the quality of their experience with us. So goodwill is crucial. Goodwill has to be earned, not just by doing the work, but by building a group of advocates for your work. Right? It would be immense folly to treat students like a passive group of people who have to be given a service, be treated, be guided. No, students are part of the resource. We need their participation, the momentum of their energy and vision. Whatever policies will be made for them, they must be involved in that, in that process because it has to meet their complex and dynamic requirements for overall wellness. So um, in terms of policy changes that can work for various educational institutions, I have a few suggestions uh, to start with and we can see how this goes in the discussion. So Priyanka, can I have the next slide please? I, okay, so I think it's so important to put money on the table to set up an autonomous mental health center that has enough resources, which includes space, private space, right? Where students can go without being, without worrying about who's gonna see me speak, without worrying about who's gonna hear me. And of course, the promise of confidentiality. Uh, we need mental health professionals who are trained for this age group, who don't see students as you know kids who need advice, but as adults with choices. Right? It, uh, I'm always taken aback how often we use the word children in higher education, and I wonder why should we, right? These are adults with choices, we should treat them as such. Um, important to pay professionals good salaries, and they should have a rewarding work atmosphere. Some referral system is, of course, needed to doctors um, who are inclined to work with this demographic. And then, of course, like I said, we need mental health advocates in the student community to incorporate them in the work. So this is uh, broadly what I wanted to present. Um, I am incredibly proud of the Student Support Center. Um, so Priyanka, if you can put the last slide, you, they can see the website, I, um, so you can visit the website. And I'm proud not just because of the work we do, but how we have done it over the last four years. This approach for me has not been about the curative or preventive, but a shared experience of learning, nurture, joy. Thank you so much, Dr. Prabhu. I think you very eloquently took us through what the Student Support Center at Manipal does. And you also highlighted your vision for the center and what your vision is for mental health policies and how they should be for universities, not just nationally, but internationally as well. And it's great to see that students do feel so comfortable. And in just four years, you've had so many sessions that shows that you're doing a wonderful job and it's actually creating the impact that it's supposed to. So thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and for telling us about all the work that you've been doing over you know, the span of so many years of being an academician. Moving on, our next speaker for today is Ms. Patty Hambler. So Patty Hambler is the current Director of Student Affairs and Services at Douglas College in Vancouver, Canada. She possesses a master's in education with over 20 years of experience in health promotion and community development on university and college campuses, Ms. Hambler has partnered with student leaders, faculty members, and campus administration to bring systematic change for a healthier post-secondary experience. As a participant in the 2015 International Conference on Health Promoting Universities and Colleges, and a co-founder of Thrive, a program focused on enhancing mental health literacy for all, Ms. Hambler is committed to the principles within the Okanagan Charter. She is currently applying the new national standard of Canada for mental health and well-being for post-secondary students to engage her own campus community in a conversation about mental well-being. I now request for Ms. Hambler to take over and begin her presentation. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to join you all the way from Vancouver, Canada this afternoon. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll jump right in with my presentation at this time. We can go to the, the next slide. I wanted to also start by sharing a little bit about um, where I'm coming from um, with this presentation. So currently, um, I am the Director of Student Affairs and Services at Douglas College. And Douglas College is uh, located uh, in the greater Vancouver area. So just kind of locating us on the Canadian map there. We have two campuses in municipalities um, very close to um, Vancouver City. And uh, we have 25,000 students taking credit and non-credit classes, um, 4,000 international students from 92 countries, and actually um, a, a large number of international students from India. So that's a bit about my contacts for my current institution. We can go to the next slide. And I just wanted to provide that within the um, Canadian context, uh, we are seeing the same kinds of things that have been talked about. I was able to join in some of the sessions earlier today. So as is the case globally in our Canadian post-secondary system, we are facing a growing concern about student mental health. Um, there's a few statistics out there. Um, some of the most concerning, of course, are looking at 16% of students having seriously considered suicide within the past year in a national uh, survey of Canadian students. And as we know, this this is a time when a lot of um, young people um, first experience mental illness. I've worked in student affairs for the past 22 years, and for the past 10 to 12 of those years, we have been engaged in a national conversation about student mental health and well-being. So in the next slide, I just want to share a little bit about um, the orientation that I'm coming to, which is a health promotion approach. Um, so for me, this metaphor and, and quote really encapsulates um, the approach that I'm taking in all of my work in on university and college campuses. So this idea, the frogs in a pond started behaving strangely, our first reaction would not be to punish them or even to treat them. Instinctively, we would wonder what is going on in the pond. And so we need to be thinking about systemic and holistic approaches and um, go beyond the individual to look at the environment. And um, when we talk about policies, I think, uh, and practices on our campuses, that's really where we need to start. So I wanted to share uh, with you, you can go to the next slide, thank you, some of the uh, key milestones in the Canadian context um, that I thought were interesting to share um, for, your, for your awareness. And um, in the handout that will be shared in the chat, there's a lot of resources that I've linked to. I'm referring to some of these key milestones. So very briefly, um, starting in about 2008 to 2010, we did a large, a, a, a large amount of data collection um, through the National College Health Assessment, which is coming out of the American College Health Association um, in the United States. And that really helped to mobilize and tell a story of what was going on with students on our campuses. Um, there was a lot of funding that was put towards um, student mental health and well-being. And um, one of the other things that happened in 2012 was the Canadian Mental Health Association and the college um, a national organization for student affairs released um, a guide for systemic approaches to mental health and well-being. And that really um, launched a movement across Canada where institutions started using that guide to develop mental health strategies. In 2015, I was part of the development of the Okanagan Charter, which I'll go into more detail um, in a bit. Um, and then in 2019, the Canadian Campus Wellbeing Survey was launched, which was a Canadian specific uh, survey to help us better understand what's going on in our Canadian campuses. And it really takes more of a health promotion lens, whereas the um, college health assessment was really looking at the individual. The Canadian Campus Wellbeing Survey takes a broader view to well-being. And then most recently, Recently in 2020, um, there was the release of a national standard um, for psychological well-being. And so I'll also spend a bit of time talking about that. So in the next slide, it just kind of highlights these two key uh, resources and, and perspectives that I want to um, dive a little bit deeper into. So um, on the next slide, we'll just talk a little bit about the Okanagan Charter. So uh, as we know, higher education plays a central role in all aspects of the development of individuals, communities, societies, and cultures, both locally and globally. So the Okanagan Charter calls upon higher education institutions to incorporate health promotion values and principles into their vi vision, mission, strategic plans, and to model and test approaches that can then be applied um, in the wider society. 
in the next slide, it just shows a couple of photos of um, where this work took place. Um, the Okanagan Charter was created in 2015 um, on the UBC Okanagan campus, the University of British Columbia Okanagan campus, following eight months of collaboration. Um, involved 45 countries and 80 campus, uh, campuses, as well as the World Health Organization. Um, and this is a, a photo of, of where that took place and um, the conference um, delegates, including myself in the little yellow circle there. So the, the charter provides us with common language and a framework for what we mean by health and well-being promotion on a campus setting. And there are two calls for action within the charter to embed health into all aspects of campus culture and to lead health promotion action and collaboration locally and globally. We can move to the next slide. Um, the charter also proposes eight principles to guide how the work can happen. And so um, for me, what this is is showing just how important um, it is to think about process and how this work happens is just as important as the, the final outcome. We can move to the next slide. So as of today, 27 post-secondary institutions across Canada have adopted the charter. I think we have the highest number um, currently within the world. Five national organizations have also endorsed the charter. And there is a national network of charter institutions that exist to support the ongoing adoption. And I'm hoping to very soon bring this to my college. I've just started working at Douglas College 10 months ago during COVID and I'm working on the development of our mental wellness strategy. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk to you briefly about is the national standard um, of Canada for mental health and well-being for post-secondary. Released in 2020, this national standard was created by a team of experts informed by extensive outreach, research, and dialogues over two years with stakeholders from across the country, including students, post-secondary administrators, service providers, and people with lived and living experience of mental illness. Its goal is to provide a consistent evidence-based framework that schools can use to enhance existing mental health strategies or develop new ones. So what is the standard? The standard offers guidance in key actionable areas, and we can just go to the next slide, to help post-secondary institutions develop a framework that meets its unique needs. It includes eight actionable areas, and like the Okanagan Charter, it takes a systems level or frog in the pond approach to student mental health and well-being. You can see all the areas that it touches on. So in the last um, two minutes, I'm just gonna quickly share with you what this has looked like in action. So on the next slide, um, with regards to one area that's been a large focus of my work is well-being and learning environments. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so we've all known, all of us that do this work, how important um, well-being is for effective learning. But there's newer research that's also showing that learning environments have a big impact on students' well-being in post-secondary. And there are two Canadian institutions who have led the way in this area. So if you go to the next slide, um, Simon Fraser University and the University of British Columbia have really led the way in a lot of this work um, through action research and also um, engaging faculty champions to identify the conditions for promoting well being within a classroom setting in higher education. And I've shared both of these resources in the handout. I, uh, I think they're excellent resources. Um, and then finally, we also have a provincial network called Healthy Minds, Healthy Campuses. It is a uh, community of practice approach. Um, and I think it really is a great example of that cross sectoral kind of um, collaboration that can really result in an effective change. It's a non-governmental organization, post-secondary institutions, as well as the provincial government working together to affect change. Um, so we can, um, the next two slides just have a couple of resources that will be shared in the handout um, and also my contact information if anyone would like to reach out at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Hambler, for taking us through what it's been like in the Canadian context, how mental well-being with respect to university students has gone from a very individual approach to 
a more systemic approach and in fact it's great because i think that's where india stands to right now we're looking to go from more of an individual approach to a systemic approach and one of the aims of our conference today is to probably and hopefully come up with a policy framework that can be implemented across universities and i think the pointers that you mentioned were extremely helpful because it showcases how important it is to look at the system as a whole like you rightly mm-hmm. mentioned right uh, not just learning but learning environments so students spend most of their time in their university settings and those environments really need to be uh, such uh, that they promote that holistic development in students so thank you so much for your extremely insightful presentation and um i'd like to take a minute here to also you know let the audience know that our center symbiosis center for emotional well-being is uh doing something very similar we are an institute that is uh, it it it's present on each and every campus we have a psychological counselor on each and every campus we provide exactly that safe comfortable space and we've had an enormous outreach in just the past 2 years we see students individually we have group counseling sessions we have a multitude of workshops and we are we are also taking an academic track where we're releasing courses in psychology and uh, value added courses in emotional intelligence etc to really equip our community uh, with resources that will help them thrive very similar to your uh, the thrive organization that you created so thank you so much and i would like to um, introduce our third speaker miss penny carlson Ms Carlson is a senior education sector project manager at Origin with a special interest in cross sector collaboration who advocates for change to improve health and well-being outcomes for students at Origin she led the development of the Australian University mental health framework and she is now working on a range of education projects including next steps for the framework Penny is experienced in managing national policy and program development in strategically engaging stakeholders to support implementation her background includes a range of roles focused on supporting students to be healthy happy and to reach their potential i now request for ms carson to take over and begin her presentation thank you very much and thank you for having me here today Um, I'm going to provide uh, just a bit of an introduction as to to origin and who we are and, and why we've been doing this work, and and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Australian University Mental Health Framework and provide a bit of background on the process that we've gone through and and where we've landed with the framework and perhaps a little bit of what might be next. So you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so Origin um, is a is an Australian not for profit organisation. So uh, we're based in Melbourne, which is where I'm speaking to you all from today. Uh, but we do work across all of Australia. Uh, we're led by our executive director, Professor Patrick McGorry, and Pat's a psychiatrist who is well known around the world for his work in early intervention and in youth mental health services. Um, he led the advocacy, which resulted in the establishment of the Headspace centres in Australia, and now popping up around the world as well. And he's still quite heavily involved in the Headspace network. At Origin, we offer a range of uh, services and supports. We provide clinical services for young people up to the age of 25. We conduct research to develop better interventions and treatments and service systems in youth mental health. We provide public education and service development to support communities to better respond to mental health in young people, and we have a team working in the policy development and advocacy area to ensure that our policymakers understand the needs and the cost of mental ill health in young people. So it was through the work of our policy team that we began to focus on the needs of the university students, uh, and this under the radar. It was a policy report that was released in May 2017, and it looked at what we knew about the mental health of Australian university students and what the impact of mental ill health was on students. 
we looked at how Australian university and mental health policies and services were responding, and, and we looked at what else we needed to do. And as you've heard, uh, on, no doubt throughout the conference, um, there are a lot of issues for students in this space. Um, we found that more than half of tertiary students aged 16 to 25 years reported high or very high psychological distress. And we also found that our student counselling and disability services within universities were struggling to meet the escalating demand and also the increasing complexity and severity of presentations. So following the Under the Radar report, uh, we received some funding from the Department of Health uh, in our federal government to develop the framework over two years. Uh, so interestingly, you, we've, we've just heard from Patty about the two-year development in Canada. We've actually been on a similar journey uh, and we've actually had a number of conversations with colleagues at, at the Mental Health Commission in Canada and, and I think we've followed a similar trajectory over the last couple of years. Uh, so look, to develop the framework, we, we conducted some research. We looked at, as I said, what was happening internationally. We looked at uh, locally at what was happening in universities in Australia. Um, we talked to a lot of people and that was absolutely critical for the development of the framework. We talked to people not only in universities, but in the mental health sector and also students. We've heard how important students are in this process. And mental health doesn't sit neatly within the responsibility of, of any one organisation. And in Australia, the boundaries for service provision are often quite blurred and there's a complex mix of roles and responsibilities across federal, state and territory governments, as well as private and non-government organisations. Uh, so we, uh, as I said, uh, conducted a, a number of different consultations and I've just included a, a quick overview to, to give you a sense of what some of those conversations were. We talked with over 500 people via conference presentations, focus groups and workshops and we were driven in the work that we were doing by a high level advisory group. And we also established some expert working groups who helped us with the evidence and, and the research that sits behind the framework. We can go to the next slide, thank you. So what we heard um, was, was a, a lot. Um, it was very difficult to condense it all down in the end to just some really key things to work on. We heard a lot about the diversity of students and of universities. Um, we heard a lot about the great things that were already happening and the desire to build on work that was already happening. We also heard some contradictory perspectives from you know, some areas who wanted to focus more on prevention and promotion and others who wanted to focus more on treatments and supports. But ultimately, we actually need to do some work across all of these areas to see some real change happening. We can probably just skip straight through that one. So I'll talk a little bit about the framework now. Um, we did focus purely on universities, not in other higher education institutions. There is some interest in doing some work in that space, but that's only just starting now. And we were not funded to uh, implement the framework. So that's part of my work now is, is to look at getting some additional support to do some more work in this space. So the framework itself is structured around six uh, principles, which I will talk through now. Um, so the first one there is about making sure that it's students' needs and experiences that drive solutions. And we've heard a little bit about the importance of involving students and co-creating um, solutions. The second principle is about learning environments. And again, this echoes comments that we've already heard around the impact that the places we live and work and study can have on our mental health. The third principle is around the notion of the diversity of the communities that are within our universities and we want to embrace that and respond flexibly with the students at the centre. Uh, the next principle, thank you, uh, is around collaboration and coordination and the importance of that within the university itself as well as between universities and mental health organisations and of course with students. The fifth principle there is just emphasising the importance of students actually being able to access the supports they need when they need it uh, and acknowledging that this is certainly a shared responsibility. This is not something that sits particularly with the university. The last principle then is around the importance of continuous improvement and making sure that 
Um, we're continuing to research um, and learn more about this area. Certainly one of the things we uncovered in the Under the Radar report was a, a lack of evidence uh, around students' current experiences, and we need more research and innovation in this area. Um, moving to the next slide, um, we created a number of different documents when we released the framework in order to meet the needs of different audiences. So there's a really short and sweet overview, and then there's the framework document itself. We also developed a more in-depth report with a lot more of the uh, research and evidence behind uh, where we've landed. Um, and we also then developed a series of case studies, which was really important to make sure that we're acknowledging the work that's already happening out there in universities. There is some great work that's happening and certainly universities wanted to see what was already happening so that they could leverage that and, and build on and enhance that in their own settings. Uh, so I think that a final slide there is, is just a, a contact if, if you do want more information. I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. I do apologise for the, the sound issues that we've had. I've also noticed that uh, that slide is missing our website address. So I'll just pop that in the chat for people to access the documents and, and have a look at the information. Uh, if you're interested. But thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Ms. Carlson. I think it's great to see that Australia is also on a very similar track as Canada is. And what I really liked about what you said is, you know, and what, uh, you know, Ms. Hambler and Dr. Prabhu also said, is that it needs to be very student centric. You need to hear the needs of the student and you need to go back to them for feedback to see how your operations are actually functioning. And I think that is one of the major gaps that we've seen. We don't really you know, go to the actual stakeholders, that is the students to see what they need and you know, what they need in terms of improvement in their academic environments. So it's great to see that, you know, your framework is bolstered by case studies, by research studies, by actually seeing how it's doing in the environments that it's in, implemented in. And oh, I think that's a really great takeaway for all of us here. And hopefully we can implement some of these great principles that you all have been so wonderfully implementing in the Australian setup. So thank you so much, Ms. Carlson. I'd like to move on to our last, but not the least, our great uh, speaker from, again, an Australian setup, Dr. Paul Fung. Uh, Dr. Paul is a psychiatrist and academic with a special interest in primary healthcare. As clinical director at Paramatta Mission, an NGO specializing in community mental health, he established the Western Sydney Headspace Youth Early Psychosis Program and the Youth Enhanced Support Service. He is the academic lead for psychiatry at the Health Education and Training Institute, the largest provider for psychiatric education in New South Wales. He has also played a role in mental health policy development with the New South Wales Mental Health Commission Community Advisory Council. Dr. Paul is also a 2020 Churchill Fellow. I now request for Dr. Fung to take over and begin his presentation. Thank you, Yoshita, and uh, thank you, Dr. Garija Mahawi, for the invitation. It's good to see you again. Um, uh, I'd like to share with you um, an Australian perspective, not really with regards to policy, but primarily in terms of community youth mental health model delivery. And we've talked a bit about Headspace already. So I'd like to share with you a little bit about um, the, the thinking behind um, Headspace model and how it's constructed. So um, there was a large uh, tertiary student wellbeing survey that was completed in 2016. There were 2,600 participants, um, 16 to 25 years old, um, across 70 institutions. And um, although there were some sort of shortcomings with um, this survey, um, it doesn't fully represent um, the demographic distribution in many ways, but I still think there are lots of good learnings um, that should inform service design here. Um, of, the, of the 2,600 participants, 67% rated their mental health um, issues as poor or fair. 39% rated their physical health issues as poor or fair. 
And if you look at the K-10 spread, 65% um, of students scored pretty high, so high or very high on the K-10 score. Um, and if you compare that to the percentage in the population, it's about 20% of females that would have, you know, high or very high K-10 scores generally, or 11% of males. So 65% of students here in this cohort. And um, in, in looking at the next slide here, these were some of the, the reasons um, uh, that were affecting studies. But interestingly, I want to draw your attention to the 35% here of um, self-harm or suicidality um, amongst this group of students um, and their effect on studies. And of course, we're, when we're talking about mental health, we're not just talking about um, mental health, we're talking about other things, uh, talking about substance use. Um, so 68% um, of respondents in the past three months had substance use issues. 64% um, um, found academic issues to be very stressful, extremely stressful. 33% um, had issues with regards to income. Um, and 14% had accommodation problems as well. Um, in thinking a bit about how they accessed services, um, there was pretty good uptake, pretty good access to um, campus counselling uh, services. About 27% had access campus counselling in the last 12 months. Um, and um, But this, this graph shows that um, the, the experience they received in getting their um, campus counselling, which is the green dots, versus the campus medical, which is the orange dots, was that overall their experience was far more positive with campus medical services than with campus counselling services. Just some, just something to consider. And so, um, uh, what I'll be telling you a little bit more about today is um, primary youth mental health services like Headspace that exist in the community. Um, that service a large proportion of um, university age students um, and, and that being an, another way to deliver mental health care um, for this population. The survey participants were also asked um, whether they knew about Headspace and most of them did. So about 86% had heard of Headspace before. 33% um, of them had used some sort of Headspace service, whether they'd accessed the Headspace website in the past, whether um, they'd uh, received something online or through telephone, or whether they'd visited a Headspace centre. Headspace um, uh, has now grown um, over the last 15 years or so to more than 120 centres across Australia. They're spread out um, in metropolitan and rural areas, and um, they're really popular. Politicians really like to open headspace centres. Um, and uh, as each, each community um, really advocates for, for one to be opened up for them. And if you look at, Headspace centres here. This is just to give you a sense for what they look like. Um, so they're um, really youth friendly. They're bright. They're not like a doctor's clinic. There are often large waiting room areas with bean bags. They're showing a movie at the same time and there's free food. Um, some of the Headspace centres have drop in spaces where um, young people can come in and play games. Um, uh, just without necessarily having an appointment. Um, and uh, they're located in highly strategic, um, visible locations. Um, they have to be near public transport. Sometimes they're located near shopping centres and also in universities. So the University of Canberra is an example of that. Um, uh, Dr. Garija will, will remember um, the, the Mount Druid Headspace site where we both work together. Um, and you can see, you know, uh, that there's lots of um, energy and a lot of the clinicians are also um, uh, very enthusiastic as well. So let me tell you a little bit about the Headspace um, sort of setup. It is designed to be a what we call a one-stop shop. And um, it's a one-stop shop because uh, we recognise that um, when young people want to get care, they, they, they don't want to have to go to lots of different places, but they want to be able to go to one place and receive 
lots of different aspects um, of their care um, in, a, in a more coordinated way. And so uh, you can go into a Headspace Centre and you can get mental health help, yes, you can get physical health help and drug and alcohol and vocational educational work and accommodation and other services as well. Um, they're largely appointment-based services, but because um, of the, you know, the, the recognition that there's a high degree of distress and suicidality in this population, um, they account for people being able to walk in and lots of after-hours appointments as well. Um, so when you come into a Headspace Centre, you'll generally get an assessment um, by a mental health clinician um, who will uh, take you through um, a HEADS assessment process, um, which is um, which you might be familiar with. Um, and then after that, uh, uh, take you through a course generally of cognitive behavioural therapy. In some Headspace centres, there might be some single session family work and there might be some group programs. Um, uh, what, what's important is also the sort of medical staffing here. So um, by having the, um, some headspace centres have psychiatrists embedded with them and also GPs embedded in them, you're getting not only that, you know, holistic mind-body care, but you, you're getting a front-loading of expertise in primary care. So generally, you know, psychiatrists are based in um, tertiary centres or, 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 or the private sector. Um, so how, how else do people stop cycling around in primary care, um, getting generally fairly in, um, you know, inadequate assessments at times for these more complex presentations um, and then getting worse and worse? Uh, what you have is actually the, a front loading of diagnostic expertise by having a psychiatrist in these centres so as to get people the right care at the right time. Um, and so uh, uh, what we also have then is um, the drug and alcohol component, the study support, getting people a job because we recognise that um, uh, income is a big stress for people um, and, and accommodation for, for young people as well. Um, uh, what we talked a little bit about again was also the idea that these centres are um, uh, highly informed and also co-created by young people. So this is the youth advisory group for one of our centres and um, they, they make important decisions around looking at um, uh, the, the centre policies and even interviewing some staff as well. So where this where Headspace fits in the primary care set care model is it fits in this kind of mild to moderate mental illness category here. So what you can see here in the step care continuum is that for the well population here on the left, um, you only really need self-help resources. For those that are more at risk, you might need self-help resources plus digital mental health. But once you're getting into mild or moderate mental illness, you're looking at low intensity um, or, or, or more moderate intensity face-to-face -face clinical supports. Um, what we found, though, with those K10 scores is that actually distress levels are really, really high. And so as um, it, it has um, become apparent that uh, Headspace centres really were dealing with very high K10 scores and quite a high degree of complexity that was really more um, challenging than um, a, a psychologist could manage on their own, what, what um, the thinking around it was that there really needed to be some more models designed with some multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach um, uh, for those with more severe mental illness. And so um, in Australia, there's been um, a building of the back end of Headspace. So um, uh, the Headspace front door, again, is for anyone and everyone that wants to be able to get a, a, um, a primary a care intervention. But then sitting behind that are some specialist programs. You have the Headspace Early Psychosis Program um, for people with psychotic symptoms. And then you also have um, the Youth Enhanced um, Service, which uh, has presentations for all, all, all other sort of diagnostic presentations, those with personality vulnerabilities, um, body image issues, um, uh, and, and co complex kind of uh, suicide, suicidal gestures. Um, and so, uh, uh, this is where we're up to at the moment in terms of building out the um, primary care uh, mental health space. 
And so that's my um, contact detail. Thank you um, for, for having me and uh, please shoot any questions my way. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Fung. I think that was extremely insightful. It's great to see that Headspace has come such a long way. Y'all have opened 120 centers across Australia. I think that itself is a huge milestone and it really shows to the world the number of lives that you are touching and reaching and the need for mental health intervention across the youth today. And what I think you also highlighted very eloquently is the need for a holistic treatment approach because mind and body both exist in cohesion and you cannot look after the mind without looking after the body and so to have all those aspects under one roof is so important and that's what we aspire to do and that's what Symbiosis also does uh, undertake after setting up their health center they set up an emotional well-being center and now we work in collaboration with one another to really aim for that holistic development and treatment for each and every student and faculty on our campus. So thank you so much for all your wonderful presentations. I know we're a little short on time, so I'm going to quickly deep dive into the Q&A that uh, we have planned for you. So if all the speakers could please switch on their cameras, it would be great. All right. OK, thank you. So my first question uh, for Dr. Gayatri Prabhu uh, would be that Ma you have set up the student support center on the Manipal campus. I wanted to ask you whether you considered the state or the government legislation when this center was set up. So the Mental Health Care Act uh, that is prevalent in India that was uh, released in 2017, is that taken into consideration when you set up such uh, uh, such centers for students on campuses. Over to you, Dr. Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you, Ishita. Um, you're right that I think of late, uh, in, in recent years in India, there has been an effort to build awareness and laws around mental health. So yes, but we have to also consider that in the, I'm sure all of you are listening and more familiar with Indian higher education context, realize that things are a little different when it comes to specifically applying or even the policies for higher education. Um, what we have largely, if you know, to be honest, are more like moral guidelines or ethical directives. We should be there for students or we should reach out to students. We should set up resources for students. So there are a lot of these um, with the mostly nebulous and open to interpretation kind of uh, moral directions is how I look at it. So to my mind, what is missing and which is why I think conf this conference is important is that what we need is something really concrete, right? Um, for example, um, you know, earmark a percentage of every higher education institution should earmark a percentage of its budget for mental health, for example, right? Or for saying we must have more tangible goals, you know, committees set up with stakeholders. That kind, so the law is still in terms of policy making in higher education, to my mind, is still very broad. And anything and everything we do, like what Symbiosis is doing, what Manipal is doing, anything we do is actually, um, in some ways, we are left to formulate our own policies, right? Uh, in the, in, so it's not so much about divergence or adherence, but it's about interpretation. And we definitely need more concrete, more commitment of resources is something that we definitely need in India, something that can be applied across the country, different kinds of institutions. Yeah. Absolutely, ma'am. I think you hit the nail on the head by telling us that the policies that we have in place are not entirely specific. And if anything, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any policy for university setups per se. And so for us to be the for in the forefront, creating that framework, because your center, our center, these are the two that I've heard of that are extremely active in this domain. And I think we've learned a lot from what is happening in the Canadian context, what is happening in the Australian context, and we can really take it away and add that to the work that we've done to pave, pave the path forward to create this policy. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Prabhu. Thank you. And also thank you to the other participants. I really enjoyed listening to you all. So thank you for all the insights. I know much to gain. Thank you.
So my next question is for Ms. Tarsan. So there are a lot of aspects of mental well-being for us to consider when we're drafting a mental health policy at a university level. What, according to you, would be the top three factors a university should prioritize when drafting such policies? Um, interestingly, my, my response to this question is actually less focused on, on the mental health and well-being aspect and, and more focused on the process because I think that's that's what will help get the outcomes that are needed. And a, a lot of it is echoing what's already been said. I think involved students. Um, certainly what we heard from our universities was that each of the campuses is different and they have a different mix of students. And so what works in one setting may not work in another. So I think it's really important to work with the students that will actually be the beneficiaries of any interventions that are developed. Um, and, and something else we heard from our students too was to make sure that so there are a range of different ways to be involved and to also think about the impact of involvement on those students. So perhaps if you're offering something around exam time, that might not get too many participants coming along. So make sure that you think about the student's context. I think um, something that addresses the whole of university context is important. So looking at all parts of the university, looking at the learning and teaching, looking at the policies and procedures, looking at the research components, as well as the student services and supports, and making sure that any initiatives that are developed are actually aligned across all of those areas, that we're not just going off and doing different things in different spaces that don't talk to each other. And then finally, um, I think the importance of collaboration was something else that came through for us. And I think that was, um, emphasized quite nicely in, in a slide from Dr. Faulkner uh, before in the Headspace Centres with all of those different services working together. Again, what students want is to be able to almost have a one-stop shop. So for, for universities and for the mental health sector, it's about finding ways to work together and to think about what are those different services and supports that we need to bring together for the benefit of the students that we're dealing with. Absolutely, Ms. Carlson. So the factors that I hear from you that we should take under consideration would be first and foremost, the process. Second would be the student voice and to include diversity when we're listening to the student voice. Third off, for the initiatives that we carry out to be aligned across all constituents, all departments, so as they are, you know, they're working hand in hand to serve the student holistically. And Last but not the least, collaboration across all dimensions of health, as well as collaboration among stakeholders is extremely important when you draft a policy. So thank you. Thank you so much for answering our question. Uh, my next question is for Ms. Hambler. So what are some of the parameters that we would need to draft in order to understand whether the mental health policies that we have created are serving the needs they are meant to be serving. So what kind of feedback would you say that we would need to collect to see whether it's functioning in the way it's supposed to? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to echo pretty much almost exactly what um, Penny just shared. Student involvement at all levels of policy development is really critical. This includes um, as we identify needs, as we develop policies, as we assess impact, um, this kind of participatory approach allows for student voices at all stages. Um, and then secondly, I would say using validated tools to measure impact of policies and practices over time. So developing some form of data dashboard where you can set targets and track whether change is happening over time. However, with health promotion, uh, it's notoriously difficult to measure change sometimes with health promotion efforts. And so that continuous qualitative data collection through various channels from students, from service providers and faculty members is really important throughout the entire process. Absolutely, Ms. Handlow. I think 
that was very well answered. So student involvement at all levels needs to be there. We need feedback from the start to the end from the students because they're who we're catering to most of all. And secondly, for us to have assessment tools, like it's easy to assess progress when there's a physical disorder, when, when there's a physical disability, like there are sugar levels that tell us whether our diabetes is in control or not. But when it comes to mental health, it's a little more challenging because it's qualitative. So we need to be able to collate that feedback from faculty members, from parents, from you know maybe student relationships, the friends that they have, uh, the you know romantic relationships that we have. Get all these stakeholders on board and really collate that qualitative data. So thank you so much, Ms. Hambler. And last but not the least, again, Mr. Uh, Dr. Fung, here's a question for you, because you work in a very community-driven approach at Paramatha Mission as well as at Headspace. What aspects of community involvement do you think we need to consider when drafting such mental health policies at the university level? Yeah, look, I think there are lots of different pathways to care. And I think the more pathways we have, the better. Um, and so um, if, if you're not gonna get, you know, campus counseling, hopefully you would be willing to access um, campus health, medical health, uh, help um, uh, and from there we know that you know um, the, the vast majority of people who have um, mental health issues present primarily first of all with somatic symptoms with physical health complaints and so being able to have very clear pathways between those two um, uh, uh, sections um, I think is important um, and then having the, the, the choice for going to an outside center outside the university um, uh, is, is, is important. Um, by the time you kind of recognise that you have a mental health issue, by the time you put your hand up, you really are, you know, pretty far along the track. You, you have a degree of, you know, severity. Um, it's really impacting on your life. How do we catch people a little bit earlier? How do we kind of integrate with physical health care, how do we think a little bit about identifying loss of functioning in different areas of life and be able to link that into um, your, you know, uh, emotional wellbeing centre? Absolutely, Dr. Fung. So making sure that we have that collaboration, that referral system and integrating both the physical and the mental is extremely important to ensure that community uh, is involved and that's how we can provide holistic treatment for our students. So thank you so much for that. I would really uh, like to take a second and thank all our wonderful panelists for such beautiful presentations, answering all our questions. We had a lot more questions, but unfortunately not much time. So thank you for answering the questions and really helping us understand the way forward because we started and we just need to take the next step. So thank you once again.